Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on wherever you are in the world today. And welcome to the Ad Age webcast sponsored by Synthesio. The topic of today's webcast is Move from Social Listening to Social Intelligence, How to Turn Insights into Action. I'm Christopher Hosford with the Ad Age team, and I'm your moderator today. We have just a few quick items to go over before we begin. We'll hear from today's presenters, and then we'll open the floor to your questions. Uh, now, to participate in the Q&A portion of the webcast, all you have to do is type your question into the Ask a Question text area, and then click the Submit button. You can submit the questions, your questions at any time during the webcast to either or uh, both of our presenters, and we'll address as many of them as possible uh, as time permits after our presenters prepare remarks. Now, please also note the series of widgets that are available for you towards the bottom of the console. Now, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. Greg Roth is Director of Marketing at Synthesio. Greg is a pioneer in the social software as a service space, having spent the last 10 years educating brands and agencies on strategic best practices and the power of data-driven digital marketing. Greg provides strategy and execution across multiple facets of Synthesio's marketing machine while driving development of sales acceleration, product education, and digital content deliverables. Uh, joining Greg today is Jeff Morgan, who is Worldwide Social Team Lead, Small Business Group at Intuit. In this role, Jeff is the global social po point person for Intuit's QuickBooks team and is responsible for the organization's social listening and reporting technology and strategy. Now, before I hand it off to our first presenter, however, um, we'd like to ask the audience to respond to a simple poll question to give us a sense about where you are in the social listening sphere. And here it is. Do you currently have a social listening, listening program? Uh, it couldn't be simpler, yes or no. And if you'll take just a few seconds to answer, uh, I'd like to remind everybody about the Q&A portion that comes up at the end. As Greg and Jeff offer their insights, please make sure to send us your, your questions. Now, since it's such a simple poll question, I'm going to push it now quickly to the results. Do you currently have a social listening program, yes or no? And let's see how we did. Well, about evenly divided, yes and no. Uh, I'm sure the yes folks will gain a lot uh, in perfecting their social listening, and the no people will like to know uh, a lot more about how to, how to set it up. Uh, Greg, what do you think about this uh, virtual tie in, uh, in the poll? Well, I'm glad we're not going to the uh, electoral college here for the results. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I was kind of expecting a 50-50 split here, uh, and that's why I uh, focused the presentation today on a bunch of uh, kind of rudimentary educational strategies as well as some real deep dives into use cases, um, hypothetical use cases with several brands. So uh, what we'll do first here is um, we will move to the uh, agenda for today's broadcast. So we're going to be talking about driving ROI with social intelligence, and the first thing that we're going to need to do today is uh, defining the rules. That's going to be um, some common vocabulary that we use in, in social listening, social intelligence, so that um, we don't go way over your head deeper into the broadcast. The uh, next stage is going to be how can social listening help to meet business goals and solve business problems? Like I said, we'll dive into four hypothetical use cases uh, these are common use cases that we encounter at Synthesio with many of our clients. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll go from the hypothetical to the real, from theory to practice, and we'll toss it over to Jeff Morgan, who uh, will give us a uh, kind of a deep look into how Intuit uses social listening and social intelligence to drive uh, business processes and business decisions really uh, across the board. So let's dive right into it. Uh, when I said before we're going to define the rules, there's a bunch of common terminology that we use uh, at Synthesio when we talk about social listening. So moving left to right here, just uh, to give you the basics, uh, there's a common vocabulary. So queries, when I mention queries, that is building data queries that are almost like uh, putting a search into a Google search engine. 
So this is what's going to be driving what you're looking for on the web. So in the same way that you're looking for something on Google, uh, social listening software functions in much the same way, but the scope is much wider. I like to call it kind of a Google of Googles. Uh, then we have keywords, much in the same way that you would use a keyword to search for what you're looking for in Google, you're going to do the same thing with social listening. Sources is really where we get into the, the deeper part and jumping away from what you know from search. So we, with social listening, what you can do is you can differentiate between where you want your data to come from. You can choose certain places that you want everything to come from, and you can choose to blacklist other places. In the, uh, in the same way, we uh, define authors as the people who are writing posts. So this is pe bloggers, uh, you know, profiles on social media. You might want to listen to everything that one person is saying, but you might find that there are several accounts that are highly spammy that you don't want to pull into your data stream. So you would want to blacklist those. Uh, and then the last uh, piece of vocabulary is influence. So what we call as influence is, is the power of a person to uh, make other social uh, users make decisions or share content or engage with a particular brand. So there are several different ways that uh, we measure influence, but generally it's um, defined by the amount of followers and the amount of volume that you create as a result of the messaging that you're putting out. So that leaves us with metrics. So rather than get into individual KPIs right now, what I'll do is really define metrics in general terms, how we look at um, looking at the data that we're measuring at Synthesio is really based on what I would say is five major buckets. The first being volume. How much are people talking? You know, that, that's the basics of what we're looking for. Is there a tremendous amount of volume around your brand keywords and very little amount of volume around your competitors' keywords? Then time. When are people talking about your brand? Is there a severe spike at a certain point in time every day or every week? So we're able to, to really drill down to figure out uh, when people are talking about your brand and how often. And that really is a great way to start to spot trends and uh, develop your content marketing strategies. Then we look at uh, emotions. So we do this in several ways, but in general terms, we are looking for are people saying good things or is they saying bad things? And this sentiment ed engine is driven by machine learning. So there's a constantly fluctuating list of positive and negative keywords that can influence the sentiment of a post that's going out about a brand. So we're looking to see uh, are people hating or are they loving. The next thing is potential. So this is the potential reach of your messaging or the potential resonance of an influencer's post. So this is really like measuring uh, what could possibly happen as a result of messaging on social media or even in mainstream media. And then the last thing is value. Can you determine the value of an earned media post or an influencer's uh, posting on behalf of your brand? So this leads us to the common use cases. And the common use cases are really four general buckets that capture most of what we do with our clients on our social intelligence platform. The first and simplest is brand health. So brand health is really your basic competitive analysis is, is your share of voice higher than your competitor's share of voice? Is your sentiment higher than your competitor's uh, sentiment? Then there's campaign analysis. If you sponsor the Olympics, uh, you're really going to have no measurable way of knowing if your campaign resonated unless you're using a social li listening program. The same thing is true across all sponsored events. People start talking about your brand in relation to the event that you're sponsoring, they're posting videos, they're posting Instagram photos, and the only way to sh really surefire collect all of this information and see if your, your uh, sponsorship and campaign dollars paid off is looking to see how much people are talking and whether they are positive or negative in terms of their reaction to your sponsorship or campaign. The next use case would be market research. Market research uh, encompasses a lot of things. It really is different for every business vertical and for every brand. A catch-all here in market research would be trend identification, which we'll talk about 
a little later, and that is really looking for fluctuations in volume and sentiment across time to determine what people are talking about and how often they're talking about it to try to spot those trends before they happen. The last uh, use case, and the one that really many of our clients start with is crisis management, because at its simplest form, crisis management is about uh, spotting these spikes in volume that are negative about your brand or positive about your brand, even in some cases, but mostly negative when we're talking about uh, potential things that could harm or impact your brand reputation. So uh, using a complex alerting system, you can really set triggers for a whole bunch of different factors to determine uh, you know, how you want to react to a crisis and whether or not it's even worth it. So what we'll do with all of this vocabulary is really try to answer the question, how can social listening help to meet different business goals and solve different business problems? So what I did for this particular presentation was focused on the, the jolliest time of year. It's the holiday season. So I figured that the examples that I'd push out to you uh, would really focus on uh, topical things. So in terms of crisis management, how does a brand mitigate potential crisis uh, during the busiest time of year, particularly uh, for retail and for travel? This is a high-volume time of year, and it's a high-volume time of year for complaints. So how do you get ahead of these things so they don't spiral into disaster? The next being brand health. Uh, why is my brand losing market share to the competition during the holidays? You know, you might have planned a tremendous holiday campaign or, uh, you know, have been riding a high market share all year and all of a sudden it starts to dip. You want to know why. What are the competition doing at the holidays to start to cut into your share? Then we have campaign analysis. So, you know, you run television ads. You want to know, are your ads uh, resonating? Are they building brand awareness? Are customers talking about these ads? And how far away from your core market are people talking about these ads? And then the last thing, uh, you know, kind of the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is the uh, trend analysis. So what are people shopping for this holiday season? How do you get ahead of that, particularly if you're in retail and you want to know, what do I stock up on and what do I really not bet the farm on that everybody uh, should have been talking about, but it turns out they're not talking about? So what we'll do before we jump into the four hypothetical use cases, uh, we have a quick poll question that uh, Chris is going to push out to you guys. Absolutely. Well, thanks a lot, Greg. You know, uh, uh, while Greg was mentioning all the various use cases, we'd now like to get an idea of how our audience actually would like to concentrate uh, or is indeed concentrating um, via their social listening. And here are the, here are the use cases. Um, you know, please choose as many here as you'd like. And, and, and since the, um, the audience was practically uh, divided in those who use social listening and those who don't use social listening, I would encourage those who don't use social listening yet to choose those areas of concentration that they would like social listening to impact on. And here they are, market research, brand management, audience segmentation, product and campaign launch, crisis management, and customer management. Which use cases do you concentrate on or would like to concentrate on with your social listening? Now, as your answer, uh, I'd like to uh, let you know that uh, the entire webinar will be available on demand. Uh, you'll get an email um, after the webinar is concluded. Look for it in about a day or so. Keep your eyes peeled on that, and you'll be able to download it again, listen to it again for future reference. Well, I think we've got all of our answers in. Which use cases do you concentrate on with your social listening program, or perhaps would like to once you get it up and running? Let's see how we did. Very, very evenly uh, distributed. Market research, top of the list. Brand management, next. Uh, Greg, what do you think about those results? Again, a very even result. All of them seem like good use cases to our audience. Yeah, I mean, at this time of year, uh, I'm not surprised that market research is is the thing that's going to resonate as well as uh, brand management because, you know, a, a lot of business verticals do a huge portion of their rev revenue during the fourth quarter, and they want to know how to prepare uh, for this quarter and for this quarter next year because you always need to look ahead uh, if you're driving your revenue during the holiday season. 
So what we'll do then is start with what looks like to be one of the uh, least popular use cases, which is crisis management. Uh, and I use this one as our first example because it's a really simple example. And uh, before we get into the use cases, what I uh, want to explain based on the vocabulary that I used at the beginning of the broadcast is I built some very simple queries to try to solve these business problems. And by simple, I mean I use brand keywords in relation with other commonly used keywords that might surface information about the question that I'm looking for. So in this case, with crisis management, I wanted to know how do I protect against potential crisis during the busiest uh, time of year? And what I used as my hypothetical uh, business here was Airbnb. During the uh, holiday season, it's a high volume time for travelers, and Airbnb is in a particularly uh, interesting uh, vertical when it comes to travel and tourism because they don't have 100% complete control over the locations that people stay at. So that means we're going to surface complaints more and more frequently. And because of their business model, you have people paying other people through a uh, central party, you're going to run into a lot of people chattering on social media. So what our solution here is the hot button issue monitoring to alert and engage when social users post trigger words or when sentiment and volume metrics cross predetermined thresholds. So I mentioned that we're going to use Airbnb as our example here. And at the top of the slide, you see it says customers don't always complain to customer service. So even if you're using Twitter as a customer service channel or you have an online customer service channel, Many times, your customers are not going to go to those channels on purpose because they want to broadcast to the world their complaints as kind of a little uh, you know, poke in the back to you because they're angry with your brand. So in this case, you know, we used Airbnb, and what I did was I filtered out all negative complaints about discrimination because there are an awful lot in the news, and I wanted to just try to surface the complaints that travelers were going to have that were common uh, – that Airbnb might be looking for to uh, answer immediately. So you see here, I just looked for the basic share of voice for Airbnb for the words refund, broken, dirty, trashed, and security deposit. And you can see refund alarmingly is at the top of the list with 57% of the mentions. So this was just during the holiday weekend over Thanksgiving. We have 159 total complaints that are outside typical customer service channels. So if you look at a bunch of the complaints here that I surfaced across the board, whether it's uh, dirty, broken, or refund, you can see that there are problems that aren't getting uh, surfaced through own channels. And you need to be able to address these problems. And then the, the second issue that you're going to want to look to solve here is who are the trolls? Who are the people who I mentioned before are going out of their way to broadcast their complaints to the world? And then lastly, you want to be able to proactively uh, address these complaints uh, through your customer service or through different channels to make sure that these people don't damage your brand integrity. This, you know, is another thing that often happens with airlines where once somebody starts complaining, if it's an influencer who has a high volume of followers and uh, a high influence over their audience, a message could get retweeted over and over and over and over again, and that could really do damage to your brand in the long term. So when I looked at a specific example here, one person uh, complained about a refund, and he did it in a snarky manner. Pretty sure this is grounds for a full Airbnb refund. There's a puzzle missing a piece. Um, we're going to organize. So uh, this guy, Dieter Bonn, is the executive editor of The Verge. He has high influence over his followers. If he actually had a real complaint, then this really could have spiraled out of control. So what you want to do is be able to identify these influencers and react immediately. And in this case, what you've done is you identified an influencer and you can proactively get ahead by establishing a relationship with them so that they are posting good things on your behalf as well as bad things. So what we'll do next is move on to brand health. So this was a, a, a popular one in the poll, brand management, brand health, same thing. Why is my brand losing market share to the competition during the holidays? What I look for here is a solution, uh, a competitive analysis of market share voice to determine the audience perception of competition strengths and your weaknesses. And during the holiday season, it's a high volume time 
for uh, a brand like Blue Apron. So for those of you who don't know, Blue Apron is uh, probably the leader in the space in home food delivery, uh, and they own the market share historically over time. And I looked at, uh, again, just uh, the week of Thanksgiving here in the U.S., and what I wanted to see was uh, how is Blue Apron's market share, uh, you know, trending over time and why are things trending downward or upward in certain cases for their competition. So if you, you look at this uh, dashboard here that I presented in front of you, you see that, you know, Blue Apron owns a very confident market share, but then you start to see some alarming things in the other two charts. On the upper right, you see the sentiment analysis by topic. So despite the fact that Blue Apron has the highest amount of volume about their brand, they also have the lowest uh, percentage of positive sentiment. And it's strange how you look up and down the chart and the brands with the lowest volume of comments have the highest amount of sentiment. So that's something that might alarm you that these niche co competitors who are starting to enter the market are really uh, delivering products that are resonating with consumers. The second thing that might be alarming from a brand health perspective when you look at the topics timeline is that Blue Apron does own the share of voice over this time period that we're looking at. But over time, you're starting to see HelloFresh start to really dig into that share of voice. And as we get to the final few days of the Thanksgiving holiday, we almost cross over for the first time. So this, again, is a signal of you've got to do something. So what you want to look for with your social listening program is what are the problems that people have with my brand and what are the things that they love about the competition so that I can use that knowledge to improve what I'm delivering to my customers. So Blue Apron, if you look at what people are saying about their particular brand, you're going to be able to surface the most frequent gripes, and you're going to be able to use these learnings to transform the business. So you look at the right here, three sample posts from the holiday weekend. We see one uh, really kind of destroyed and rotten-looking meal that was delivered in terrible condition. We see uh, complaints about FedEx, which were very, very high volume when it comes to Blue Apron's orders, that people didn't like the FedEx delivery service, and a uh, complaint about a particular recipe. Well, you know, these might seem innocuous, but if they come in high volume, you start to see that these are frequent complaints around your brand. Then you look at the competition, and you could gain insights into how to improve your business. Now, here are some really, really interesting things that you as Blue Apron could use to uh, transform the way you do business. So some of the super high volume keywords around their competition were fresh, organic, and sustainable. These are things that are resonating with consumers on social media. You look at the second post here, it's a retweet uh, of HelloFresh, and it's a recipe that people loved. They loved making this meal. So again, you had somebody complaining about a recipe on your own channels, but here's a recipe that you could just modify and grab as your own to try to beat the competition. And again, at the bottom, fresh ingredients and chef-designed recipes. Try home chef as a $50 gift. Now, this is not typically the type of engagement that you want where people are looking to try to win a contest. But when you look at the last part of the sentence, this was fun and easier than Blue Apron. This is a huge, huge piece of market knowledge for Blue Apron because they, if they see enough complaints about their recipes and their processes not being fun and being too hard to do, they're going to be able to uh, learn an awful lot about how to transform their business. Next, we'll talk about campaign analysis. So are my holiday ads building brand awareness and resonating with consumers? And the solution here is an audience perception analysis designed to gather intelligence for upcoming holiday promotions. So whether that's this year or next year, you're going to be able to learn an awful lot from what you've done with your television ads based on what people are saying on television, I mean on the, on the Internet. So we move to my next example, the good, the bad, and the resonant. So here we have two um, regional department store brands, Kohl's in the U.S., John Lewis in the U.K., both had uh, holiday campaigns this year that started just before Thanksgiving. Uh, John Lewis uh, is known for their holiday ads, which already creates this pre-engagement with an audience that's waiting to see what happens this year. 
Kohl's, on the other hand, not known for their holiday ads, but known for their holiday sales. So if you look at the charts here, what you're going to see here on Kohl's, their top timeline, and John Lewis's top timeline, is the resonance over time over the course of the month of November for their holiday ads, people talking about their campaigns. And there are a couple of interesting things here. On Kohl's' end, you see a bunch of different spikes. So these are you know, promotions for sales that people are talking about. They're retweeting messaging. So you have spikes over time. John Lewis releases one holiday commercial, and they have a tremendous spike and what looks like a lull for the rest of the month, the beginning and end of the month. But what you have to look at really closely is the numbers on the left side of the chart. So while Kohl's is generating spikes over time, their volume is minuscule in comparison to John Lewis. So even those flat lines for John Lewis building up and leading away from that spike in the middle of the graph are much higher than Kohl's. The bottom two graphs that you're going to look at here with Kohl's and John Lewis are the day of the highest spike. So this is looking for what time does your messaging resonate most with the people who are talking about your brand. So the clock that we're looking at is a 24-hour clock based on New York time. So Kohl's releases a holiday promotion uh, just after midnight, and obviously that uh, troughs downward and then spikes upward throughout the day and then slowly uh, trends down throughout the afternoon and gets another minor spike in the evening. So this is what you would expect. People are sleeping. They go to work. They start sharing messaging around lunchtime. It lulls off while they're at work in the afternoon. You get a couple of minor spikes in the evening. Now when you look at John Lewis, it's a totally different type of trend chart. Now this is over 24 hours when they release their ad. You see that if you look at the 24-hour uh, clock, what you have to realize is it's a, a couple of hours, uh, four or five hours ahead where the ad is released. So what we're looking at on this chart is at 9 a.m. in the U.K. when the, the ad is released, we have our biggest spike and it lulls off during the day. But the amount of volume that's happening around this is much higher than anything that Kohl's ever gets. So what do we do about this? I mean, how do we solve this problem of either, you know, uh, spiking in low volume or spiking in high volume with kind of lulling off over time. So when we talk about coals and their spikes, they're generating what I call the wrong kind of engagement. So their spikes are not based around really engaged users. What they're based around is people retweeting chances to win gift cards. They're uh, complaining about the corporate, corporate uh, policies of the brand. They're making snarky comments about the messiness of the store. So this isn't the kind of thing that you want to see if you're Kohl's and you're trying to drive consumers into stores. On the other hand, if you're John Lewis and you put out this holiday ad and all of a sudden people are pretending to be Buster the Boxer, sending photos of their own dog watching the commercial on TV, going into your stores to take photos with your Busted the Boxer display. You've hit the mainstream media with how good your ad is. This is the right kind of engagement, and this is why the Buster the Boxer, John Lewis ads spread out of the U.K. and into the rest of the world. It builds brand awareness for a brand that most people can't even shop at. Our last business problem is the one I say for the end, and it was the one I figured was going to surface the most uh, interest in our polls, and that is market research. What are people shopping for this holiday season? What could they potentially be shopping for next holiday season or throughout next year? And this is all about trend monitoring, monitoring to uh, proactively get ahead of market demands. So the use case that I used for the holiday season uh, for market research was kind of a simple one in my mind. The one thing that really drives a tremendous amount of volume on the Internet during this time of year uh, are toys. Uh, people are shopping for their kids. Most uh, toy and collectible brands wait until this time of year to release their, um, you know, their long sought after products, and this is including video games as well. So what I was trying to do with my query here was uh, not only find the next big thing, but find what people were going to be looking for this holiday season and maybe in uh, the days to come. So the way I got the uh, toys and games that I put on my list was uh, I did some research over time to determine 
what were the toys that the major uh, e-commerce retailers were pushing, what were people talking about in high volume that I was able to spot on Google Trends, and really just market knowledge. Uh, and that market knowledge comes from my nieces and nephews who talk about these toys. So uh, what, we, what I put into my query was Lego Dimensions, Hatchimals, Shopkins, Skylanders, uh, Snuggles, my dream puppy, and the Mario Kart quadcopter. One of the things that I left out of the query, uh, actually two things that I left out of the query because their volume skewed things in such a tremendous direction that I wouldn't have gotten surefire results were uh, Pokemon and uh, the mini Nintendo console. Those two are generating so much volume that uh, I had to exclude them from the uh, study. So they're obvious trends. Um, and if you don't know about them and you're in the toy market, uh, then you should probably turn your computer on and uh, Google something. Uh, next thing here was what I wanted to look at was what were the words that people were using most often in the highest volume when they're talking about these toys that are trending during the holiday season. So you see on the left that LEGO uh, Dimensions uh, mightily won the share of voice competition over Hatchimals uh, and Shopkins, and then Skylanders alarmingly towards the bottom here. Now, when you look at the sentiment word cloud, you start to see the words that people are using most often to talk about these brands. And the interesting thing about these word clouds is that they don't just include the keywords you're looking for. They include the keywords that people are using when they use your keyword. So you start to see other brands, other toys, other opportunities uh, surface within these word clouds that you can grab a hold of. So what we'll do is we'll jump into four separate word clouds here. Now, one of the things that we could have seen from this first word cloud on the previous slide is that obviously the toys we put in were resonating, but there is a, uh, a word here, Sonic, that you know, doesn't really make sense in the rest of the, the, uh, the pack of words. Frozen as well. So you're starting to see that there are things that don't uh, seem to belong. And we're going to be able to surface them by limiting our word clouds to each individual keyword. So we have uh, four word clouds here for the four most popular brands uh, on our chart, Lego Dimensions, Hatchimals, uh, Shopkins, and Skylanders. Now, when you look at Lego Dimensions, you start to see uh, a bunch of words come to the surface. Some of them are handles. Uh, some of them are you know, action words. Uh, in Hatchimals, you're going to start to see certain colors and certain character names come up. In Sentiment uh, Word Cloud for the Shopkins here on the lower left, you're going to start to see other character names show up. And that was what I was talking about before, is how do you find these other things that people are talking at, about beyond the things that you know about. And then on Skylanders, you're going to start to see some uh, reasons why they are not near the top of this um, list when it comes to share of voice. So what we'll do is we'll look at each one of these individually. So one of the things that we spotted in the first word cloud is Sonic the Hedgehog resonates more with fans than classic movie characters. Lego Dimensions releases a ton of licensed uh, characters for their video game. They're these little action figures that go along with the video game console. They released Ghostbusters, Gremlins. Meanwhile, Sonic the Hedgehog, a classic video game character, resonates more than all of those. When it comes to Hatchimals, you see blue, teal, pink, and green are the most popular and sought-after colors. Now, that might be kind of something that you think is an innocuous um, bit of information, but if you're creating toys for girls who are the people who are really looking for these Hatchimals, then you know that blue, teal, pink, and, uh, blue, teal, pink, and green are the colors that you want to concentrate on your line for next year. When it comes to the Shopkins on the lower left, the YouTube reviews reveal everything popular amongst the Shopkin fans. So what you're looking at here are the words that um, the fans of Shopkins use when they unbox Shopkins on their YouTube channels. So this is something that's incredibly popular in the tween market uh, where girls are, like to go out and shop for toys and then post videos about it on YouTube. So you start to see other things like Elsa and Spider-Man and Frozen uh, surface here, and these might be things that you uh, 
knew about or didn't know about that, like Spider-Man, resonates with young girls. Next thing here is uh, Skylanders. So one of the crazy things here is that while I was making this deck, Skylanders announced that they were uh, going to cancel next year's production of the line of Imaginators toys. And this was something I spotted a week before it actually happened. So the popularity of walkthrough hints, it hints at more watchers than players. So a lot of people uh, who review toys uh, on the Internet and post videos on YouTube are posting walkthrough videos. And what these walkthrough videos are are just basically the entire game played by somebody else. If you have a lot of people talking about watching these videos, it means they're watching and not playing. It means they're not going out to purchase your toy. So, you know, we were able to spot like a bunch of characters that were popular within the game, but nothing resonated nearly as highly or with as much volume as anything within the Lego Dimension told. So these were, you know, a simple way to spot trends in the toy market. And one of the things... Uh, that I think is interesting about the use cases that we walk through today is that they really are siloed within a particular industry. And when I got the opportunity uh, to, you know, jump on this webinar with Jeffrey Morgan from Intuit, one of the first things that I discovered was that Intuit really uses Synthesio's social listening in a complex way that crosses over pretty much every use case that I covered today. So what uh, I'm really excited to do now is uh, introduce Jeffrey Morgan. He's the worldwide social team lead uh, from the small business group at Intuit. And what he's going to do is take my theory into practice and show you a bunch of the things that he does on a day-to-day -day basis to leverage the power of social intelligence and uh, use that to impact his business decisions. Uh, before we do that, we're going to have a quick poll question uh, that – Chris is going to give to you. I sure am, Greg. And uh, since uh, we're introducing Jeff from Intuit, um, this should be a, a quite an interesting uh, poll question for Jeff. Uh, do you use software as a service software to manage your finances or yearly taxes? Uh, well, the year is about uh, coming to a close. Certainly, um, Intuit has its, its fingers in this pie. And uh, Jeff would like to know of our audience, which is quite large at this time, by the way, and an excellent attendance today. Do you use SAAS software to manage your finances or use yearly taxes, yes or no? And uh, while you're answering this very simple uh, question, um, please uh, keep sending those questions to uh, Greg and Jeff, um, and we'll get to as many. We already have quite a few good ones. We could always use more. So let's see how we did. Um, what's, what's cooking here with... Uh, Software as a service, yes, indeed, 37.9% uh, versus no, must be uh, either uh, doing it in their checkbook or, or uh, using it uh, on, on site, on their computer. Um, Jeff, uh, what do you think of those results? I'm sure you'd like to uh, uh, boost uh, the first uh, response a little bit more. Well, it's, it's funny that that number is going up every year. So when we look at it again next year, I'm sure it will have crossed the 50% mark. Perfect. So let me jump in here. I've got two use cases to share, and uh, they're, both, they're both based on a design principle that the, the best decisions a company can make are customer-backed. I mean, that really makes sense if you think about it. The, the smartest product or marketing team in the world isn't as good as the one that listens to its customers and acts according to what their customers are looking for. So into the first slide here, which is how we operationalize social data internally uh, on the QuickBooks team. So, um, and, and essentially what we're doing is we're looking to build a bridge between what's happening in the marketplace with our, with our customers and our prospects and other people in, in areas that were, are interesting to us and the business itself. So really looking to what we've done is we've built a, a, what's essentially a feedback mechanism that informs the organization and lets us, ta lets us act. So in the flow chart you see here, we've got a lot of things that we're looking for uh, externally, and we pull data in and we synthesize the data internally and we, we, we extract actionable insights, I'll call them, things that the people inside the business should know and will want to act on. And so what we're doing is we're looking for 
for signals in in the marketplace that uh, that are important to us, things that we'll want to uh, things that we'll want to jump on, we'll want to jump on. So sometimes, um, and and you can understand, you know, you talked about us being a SaaS business. As a SaaS business, we're we're essentially putting out a new product every month, and so we're essentially bringing our customers back every month. And so it's important that we're able to find those signals quickly, turn them into actionable insights, and act upon them in a way that will, will, will help out our customer. And so there are obviously there are lots of ways of doing that. Some channels are going to give us huge volumes of data. You know, Twitter, for example, there's a ton of information coming in. Um, others can be um, more relevant uh, because while they can be really small, there could be a, you know, a subreddit or a forum that a smaller group of people are, are participating in. There will be experts there or there will be expertise. And it will let us get early indicators of something that, it's really important for us. Um, there, are, I mean, there are a couple of classic examples. So, as a business, um, we will we'll hear from the market that um, maybe our product isn't doing something or, uh, that our customers want, or doesn't have a feature that they're looking for, and and oftentimes it actually does, and that's an indicator that our marketing team has a communication issue, and we need to do a better job explaining. Um, how our product works, um, and so that will help us adjust our adjust and target our messaging. Um, but maybe there is a gap in our product uh, feature set, and so this is great information for our product team, who obviously have a they have a product roadmap, and this can help them reprioritize. Because, you know, as Greg said earlier, sometimes the complaints don't come to the complaint department; they're just happening externally, and so it's important for us to listen to it. And the third example here is with our care team. Um, and we uh, we deliver a lot of support to our customers. And sometimes, you know, we, we have financial management software, and managing finances is often a cyclical thing. You'll do something every month or every year. So we can see things that happen on a monthly or annual basis, bring that internally, and build care content and push it out ahead of the next cycle which gives us an opportunity to uh, essentially help people before they know they need help, which is actually a delightful experience when you do it right. So jumping into the next slide, um, businesses tend to grow through sticking into their market, or sometimes they shift into adjacent spaces, and this is certainly something that we do as well. And one of the first steps in moving into an adjacent market is understanding it. And social is a social listening is, a, is really about the best tool to start that work. So, for instance, um, we did move into into an adjacent market space recently, and my team, one of my team's first jobs was to understand uh, what was going on there. So we were really looking to figure out where conversations about us in that space or, or, or our prospective customers or relevant topics were happening. Where were those people, where were people gathering to talk about those things that we would want to, to talk about or to add value to? And what were the main, what were the hot button topics they were talking about? What were the things that uh, were, were driving a lot of conversation? What were the things that are clearly big issues in that space we wanted to move into? It's really important for our, for our marketing team who are building our messaging, and we want to make sure that our messaging maps to the things that are most important to people. And the last one is who who's there? Who are those influential people? Who are the people who are creating a lot of content in the topic we care about? Or as they do create content, it gets a really big response, and, and they have a large network that they tap into. This is really important for any business that's moving into a new new area. As you start in, in a new area, you don't have a ton of brand authority necessarily. And by building relationships with influencers, you can shorten the amount of time that it takes you to build that brand authority. So as we went through this social audit of uh, the new market we wanted to go in, we, we found some pretty interesting things. Uh, when we looked at our existing social audience in our own social channels, so the Facebooks and Twitters and LinkedIns of the world, we discovered that we actually we could sub-segment into a little bit. We discovered that we had some of those new people we wanted to talk to in our audience already, which was fantastic. We have a relationship with them. Now we can speak to them in terms that are most valuable to them. 
And then the bigger segment of that is the earned social audience, so people who aren't directly connected with us. And we were able to, uh, to listen to, uh, to audit the segment and discover that there were quite a number of sub-segments in there. And this is particularly important for our business because, you know, as you move into a new segment, you can't boil the ocean, right? You need to, you need, you need to pick your paddles. You need to make some bets around where you're going to target. And this listening helped us figure out that we could go after, you know, that there were a couple of really meaty segments for us to focus on. And then a bit more of a long tail of segments or prospect areas that would be important to us, but maybe less so. And that allowed us to adjust our messaging to, uh, to them. Um, and the big takeaway from this is this is work we could do to set ourselves up for success in the new market. And, you know, my team did this from their comfortable chairs in the office with tools we had in place today. So this gives us a competitive advantage, uh, and it's pretty easy to acquire. And that's what I've got for you. Sounds great, Jeff. Um, and and the, the results of that poll, by the way, uh, are, in a nutshell, uh, social sentiment, aren't they, or direct feedback. So uh, this is a perfect opportunity to gauge uh, an online audience in real time. Well, you know, we've that's now that. come uh, – to the end of our prepared presentation, and we're ready to open the floor to your questions. As a reminder, to participate in our Q&A, just type your question into the Ask a Question text area, then click the Submit button. You know, this first uh, question, I think, uh, it should be directed uh, to Greg. Um, one of our attendees, who apparently is in the agency business, notes that one of her clients uses social sentiment as a KPI, which is all well and good, it's great to gauge the market, but how do you change and control the conversation? Uh, what proactive things, uh, Greg, um, do you think someone can do after they get this raw data to actually go in and, and change the conversation in directions they'd like it to go? And certainly, Jeff, uh, you can jump in here as well. Um, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, it's Jeff, I'm happy to give you um, a, uh, my crack at the answer. So sentiment is, is really important, and it's certainly one of, one of the metrics that we track, but we don't track it while well, we track it individually. We look at it in, in, you know, in combination with brand volume and, and engagement and, and a number of other things. <clears throat> when it comes to sentiment, there are generally two things happening, right? You're um, if you, you want sentiment, sentiment to be positive, so what can you do to, to drive positive sentiment? Um, and what can you do to minimize negative sentiment? So maybe the negative is a little easier to, to do in a sense in that it's, we can identify the, the triggers, the things that are driving negative sentiment. Um, you know, if, you're, if, you're, you know if, if a product doesn't work or people have a hard time using it, uh, if you're, whatever someone's scenario is, this is fantastic feedback for your organization because a lot of those things you can control. You know, if there, I guess, if there are controllable issues, you can fix them. The uncontrollable ones, obviously a little harder to do. On the flip side, uh, there are things that an organization will do that will drive positive sentiment, you know, and there are some some of the simple ones that Greg talked about, talked about earlier around contests and that sort of thing. But then um, your, your, your business strategy or your go-to-market strategy can dramatically affect sentiment. For example, um, we have spent a lot of time focusing on telling the stories of our customers and making them really the heroes in, 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 in small business. And that generally generates a lot of positive sentiment because people like hearing stories uh, similar to their own. That's that's one example of how you can affect it. Yeah, fantastic, uh, Greg. What do you what do you think? I, I I noted that at the beginning you had you had indicated that the need for refunds is probably a real uh, bad type of thing if you see it on social media. But I've understood that refunds, uh, especially when they're they're offered in in, in good faith, uh, can be a good way to change the conversation. What do you think about that? Absolutely, and that's one of the things that you know brands know that they could do to change the conversation. But the funny thing is, when it comes to using social sentiment as a KPI, when you're using that for, in like a crisis management situation, you're typically looking for keywords that people are using that are negative, like I showed you with dirty, broken, trashed. 
What you're not doing with that type of dashboard is looking at the types of words that are actually resonating with, with customers. What are the topics that are resonating with customers? So you could gain an awful lot of knowledge by flipping your uh, perspective on the conversation and looking at the, the positive sentiment over time. What are the things that are resonating throughout the year with your consumers? And then grabbing those little nuggets of information and surfacing them in your content strategy over time so that you can begin to kind of organically change the conversation uh, in an intelligent manner using content that you know is uh, something that your audience is going to be into. That's right, and, and I guess the implication is that you can't turn this on a dime. Uh, you, you've talked in, in several points about data for next season's uh, you know, selling period. Um, it's tough to move, the, uh, to move the ship here. Yes, it absolutely is. It, it is not something that typically can be turned on a dime. It's something that you need to, you know, when you have a crisis, win the trust back from your audience, and you can only do that with, you know, consistently smart messaging that is, you know, based on that data that you're looking at. What are the things that people like as well as the things that people dislike? Got it. Well, this next question, uh, again, comes from an agency person, and I, I think it can be posed uh, to both of you, uh, since uh, international is, is key to everything these days. How global-friendly, uh, our attendee asks, is social listening and social listening tools? Uh, and, and maybe, uh, Greg, you can kick it off. Uh, you'd mentioned the U.K. versus the U.S. study. Uh, can you speak a little bit to that? Um, are they comparable, and how about going uh, – further afield uh, internationally? Oh, sure. I mean, um, our little sales pitch here is, is that uh, we can listen uh, on the Internet in over 80 languages in over 190 countries, and that includes character-based languages, and it includes social networks in China and in Russia. So uh, our technology is kind of uh, globally agnostic when it comes to social listening, and that's really one of the things that is most attractive to our clients when they have a global brand that needs to listen to different conversations, different markets, and even different demographics within those markets around the world. Got it, Jeff. Uh, into it. Uh, are you listening internationally? Yeah, absolutely. We're a, we're a global company. We're growing quite quickly around the world, and um, so uh, yes, we need we have to have tools that. Uh, that work in countries around the world, languages around the world, but perhaps more importantly, we track our performance and we need to make sure that we are able to track consistently and really having apples to apples comparisons. And so we, we have focused on using single tool sets that allow us to work everywhere so that we know that a success in Australia looks like a success in France, looks like a success in the US. There you go. And, and one of our attendees actually asked, a question about new markets, um, and that could apply uh, to, new, to new international markets as well as domestic markets. But the question is, when entering a new market, how can you tailor social media listening to determine what are the hot topics there and what's been said there about other businesses in the same industry? Uh, you're entering a market. Competitors perhaps have already been there. Uh, uh, Greg, do you have any uh, best practices there about new market social listening? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is something that uh, we help our clients with all the time. Uh, and, you know, entering a new market doesn't necessarily even mean entering a new market geographically. In many cases, that means entering a new market demographically. So, you know, being able to enrich data with information about the, uh, the particular user's uh, age, gender, uh, job status, their location of posting, it really gives you kind of insight into – uh, what specific audience clusters of people are saying within uh, a given market or within a given location. So when it comes to expanding into a new market, I mean, you're obviously expanding into a new market. You've done your homework ahead of time, and you know the brands that are owning the market share there. So what I would do, uh, you know, just as an upfront quick challenge to myself is build a quick query around those brands and, you know, pick out some positive mentions qualitatively uh, to see what resonates in those markets for those particular brands. You know, people are always talking about their favorite brands, and you're going to be able to see 
people with high influence who are brand advocates are going to be able to start spreading messaging about trends and what it is about particular products or services that resonates with consumers in those markets. So it really is kind of a, a, a matter of casting kind of a wide net at first. That would be my initial strategy. But, uh, you know, of course, this is something that would be individually tailored to each uh, social listening program. You might have different goals right off the bat. Uh, but that's why, you know, blueprinting your social media uh, listening journey is so important and determining what your business goals are and exactly which audiences you want to listen to. Absolutely. Well, you know, inevitably the question of ROI always comes up in these discussions. And uh, it's all well and good to, to have your finger on the pulse of social media and getting all that great data in. Uh, but then, of course, uh, the proof is in the pudding, the ROI, how it paid off. And one of our attendees asks that question, is there a process, a workflow, for example, for reporting on actual ROI for all of this uh, social listening? Um, and I'll, I'll throw this out to, to both of you, Greg or Jeff, who would ever like to chime in. Uh, you know, uh, I, I could chime in um, with a, a quick answer that's not going to provide all that much detail because I definitely would need more time to talk about it. When it but when it comes to really reporting on ROI, there are several things that we do, including, uh, you know, a, a, uh, an alerting structure that lets you know whether or not uh, your messaging is resonating over time or if there are crises happening. And we also have developed uh, a new KPI called earned media value that uh, is going to uh, start to put a dollar figure on the earned messaging that your influencers and your brand advocates are uh, putting out there. So it will be a really valuable way to determine how uh, valuable organic messaging is to your brand so that you can begin to report on that uh, in an intelligent way, intelligent way up the line with the same types of figures that you use for paid media and earned uh, uh, and owned media. Fantastic. And, and Jeff, um, as far as business specific, add into it. Uh, what are you doing to uh, to get a handle on ROI of your social listening? Yeah, it's a, it's a big and important question for any business that is for profit. In our case, or you know, uh, the return someone's looking for on their investment. It's going to vary from company to company, but you generally start with um, defining what return you're looking for, and you work backwards from that. And so in our case, and particularly in my team's case, we tend to be really focused higher up the funnel, and a lot of our, our work is focused on uh, making sure people are, are, are aware of our brand, uh, become engaged with it, and we build stronger connections that you know, we would we would measure through traffic we're bringing into the organization. Um, and so, you know, the example I used a little earlier of moving into an adjacent space, or we were talking about moving into new markets around the world, from from a social uh, intelligence perspective, you're really focused on um, understanding whether people are, are you're, whether you're building brand awareness. And so, we track that, right? We track it through the number of mentions for, of our brand. Uh, overall and in comparison to competitors in the market. We track whether we're building stronger relationships with them, so we're tracking engagement. We track how many people visit our, our web properties and um, you know learn more about our brand or click to try or click to buy. So these are, if you think of it as a funnel, there are a lot of steps along the way. It really depends on the business, but as a, as a person working on the social side of things, part of my job is to make sure that we're educating the business on all of the steps you need to do to get to the point where you're selling or doing whatever's important to the business overall. So very unique to every business, but as you identify each step along the way, you can show that progress. Terrific. Well, you know, we're almost uh, at the end of our, our webinar time, but I'd like to pose this one last question. Um, and, and that is uh, for both those who have a social listening uh, program in place and those who would like to. Are there keys, and kind of keep it uh, short if you can, are there particular keys for success in developing a best-in-class social intelligence program, or for that matter, getting one off the ground to begin with? Um, uh, uh, Jeff, you first, and then uh, Greg can wrap it up. Uh, in a few words, listen <laughs> to what the market is saying, your prospects, your customers. Get the information to your business's hands and act upon what you've learned. And then if you do that, you will make your customers and prospects happy. 
Fantastic. Greg? What I would say is just like you uh, use filters when you shop for things on the Internet, filtering is incredibly important uh, when it comes to leveraging your social listening and getting to know what your audience is saying. Uh, it allows you to cut through data and really surface the, the qualitative mentions, the things that people are saying that matter the most to your brand. So uh, that's absolutely what I would uh, give as my nugget of advice to end the broadcast. Super. Well, we've reached the end of our time. We had a, a great many questions, and I can assure you, if we didn't get to your question, we'll do our best to follow up with you later. And also, please take a moment to answer our exit survey uh, to let us know how we did today. Thank you so much for attending our webinar. Remember, you can also view and listen to this presentation on demand using the same link you used to attend today, so keep your eyes peeled for that email that will tell you when it's ready. And, and also, uh, the deck is downloadable. You can download this entire deck uh, with its uh, richness of information uh, by using the particular widget at the bottom of your screen. So on behalf of our guests today, Greg Roth at Synthesio, and Jeff Morgan at Intuit, thanks so much for your time. Have a great and prosperous day.